So we're just we're going to bow in prayer before we open the word today. Jesus, we thank you for the book of Mark, and we thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're doing in the hearts and lives of people here today. God, I thank you for each person that's here. And Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon your word today. You'd help me to speak your word with clarity and in a way that people can understand so that they could make application into their hearts. And we thank you, God, for the, the beauty of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're coming right to the very end of Mark. And um, over the Easter season, we, uh, we spoke about the crucifixion. So we're, we went from the Last Supper, we talked about the Last Supper last week, and now we're going to go into the final chapter to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. So um, today my message is about the risen and exalted Savior. So if you have Bibles with you, if you want to uh, put your thumb in Mark chapter 16, we're going to be talking we're going to be going through a few scripture verses before that, but that's where our text is this morning. So after Jesus died on the cross, all of the Gospels, of, the gospels tell us that his body was removed from the cross and, and was placed in the tomb of a wealthy man uh, whose name was Joseph of Arimathea. And John chapter 19 tells us that Joseph was assisted by Nicodemus. Nicodemus the Pharisee, the, the one that, if you remember, who came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3, where we have um, Jesus telling Nicodemus that um, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is the same Nicodemus. So Nicodemus the Pharisee um, and Joseph of Arimathea, they, um, they washed, took Jesus' body and they washed it. And they wrapped it in a linen cloth, along with about 75 pounds of spices, we're told in the scriptures. Um, myrrh and some di different spices, they packed him in. Um, and then his body was placed in a tomb that was hewn out of solid rock, um, adjacent, like very close to where Jesus was crucified in this garden. There was a tomb that was hewn out of solid rock, and that's where they placed Jesus. And once they put his body in this tomb, a large stone, we're told, was rolled in front of the entrance to it. And thus, there was a 700-year-old prophecy that was fulfilled in that moment in Isaiah 53, 9, which stated, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So as I had discussed last week for those that were here, Jesus willingly went to the cross when he had that um, Passover meal, the communion that we did last week, that we remember Jesus laid down his life. He spilled his blood as the Passover lamb. He became the Passover lamb and whoever trusts in Jesus and, and, and believes in Jesus, his Shed blood is like the Passover where the death angel passes over whoever has the blood of the lamb applied to the doorposts or the thresholds of their hearts. So this is what we talked about last week. And in the process, not only was Jesus the Passover lamb that takes away our sin and makes us right with God, but he is also the bread of life. And... Uh, we, talk, we talked about how communion was like that, you know, where we break the bread. And uh, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you as often as you meet. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, because Jesus not only fulfilled the, uh, the Passover, but also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Jesus' body was broken for us. And he became the bread of life so that whoever eats of the undefiled uh, uh, bread of life, the, the words that come from the mouth of God, from Jesus, they receive nourishment and it's pure and it's holy. So Jesus also fulfilled the feast of unleavened bread. 
So according to the Gospel of Matthew, after Joseph and Nicodemus had been given permission by the governor of the land, Pontius Pilate, to take down Jesus' body and, and put it in the tomb, and that happened on the Friday. We call it Good Friday. The next day, on the Saturday, which was the Jewish Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they went to Pilate, and they asked him for a favor. In Matthew 27, 63 to 66, they said, Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, they called Jesus, that deceiver, said that after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So they heavily guarded this tomb. They were so concerned because Jesus had said that he was going to rise from the dead on the third day that they posted this guard and they, they sealed it with a seal and nobody was permitted to get there. But despite this large stone, the seal and the guard and everything that was done to discourage the disciples from coming and stealing the body, early on Sunday morning, on the third day, after Jesus had been crucified, the third day after, we're told, Matthew 28, 2 to 4, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So you can just imagine. And here's where we pick up on today's message, the story in Mark 16. Mark 16, starting with verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? From verse 3 in Mark here, we see that these ladies that went to go visit the tomb, they, had, they didn't realize that the governor, Pontius Pilate, had given permission to the Jewish leaders and, and elders to seal the tomb and to post this guard on it. So they didn't realize that. And under normal circumstances, when they would have got to the tomb, they would have found these guards guarding it, and they would have seen the seal placed over the, the stone, the stone in place, and they would not have been granted any entry into this place. But these circumstances were not normal because what was recorded in Matthew took place, and the guards fell when the angel came, like they were dead men. You see, despite the religious leaders of the nation trying to shut down anything to do with the life or legacy of Jesus, they thought that Jesus was a normal man, but Jesus was far from ordinary. He was no normal man. It's true, he died like a normal man. He had blood just like you and me, and he shed his blood for the sins of the world. But Jesus being fully man, was also fully God. And on that third day, Jesus took back his life. Where he laid it down, he picked it back up again. And he, he rose from the dead. Now God's plan was abnormal. It was a miracle. This violent earthquake uh, happened and there was this angel that was there. There's another gospel that says there was another angel as well. But there's further to the questions, you know, that they, they had. Like, what are we going to do to pack Jesus in more spices? We've got to get this stone away somehow. 
stone was large and they were trying to figure this out. But they didn't have to figure it out because God had already stepped in. And God had already raised Jesus from the dead. And he had already left the tomb. And the guards had scattered. The stone had been rolled away. When Mary, Martha, and Salome Salome, arrived on scene, the miraculous spectacle had taken place. So, in Mark 16, verse 4, we read this. But when they looked up, and saw, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he has gone ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So just as Jesus had said that he would, even at the Last Supper, he said that he would lay down his life for people. And he had told them all along that he was going to arise from the dead. Just as he said, he rose. Jesus was alive. And despite the unbelief of these religious leaders and their attempts to thwart what God had planned, God's plan was miraculous and it was abnormal. And it was something that was going to change the history of the world. Jesus triumphed over the de- over death. He triumphed over the grave, proving his critics wrong. No, he was not an ordinary man. He was not a deceiver. He was the living God come down to man, the bread of life, that whoever would partake of this bread would find life. And this fulfilled the prophecy written in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, which reads, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zeblin and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So God... God instructed the angel to pass a message to the, to, to the ladies, right? They were the ones that first witnessed the resurrection. As a matter of fact, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus Christ risen and alive. And they were told by an angel to go and tell the disciples what had happened. Can you imagine this? Here's these ladies, and they're like, wow. They were afraid. They were terrified. You stand in front of someone that looks like lightning, like an angel? Yeah, you'd be terrified too. They were trembling. Verse 8 says they're trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to, no, to, to anyone because they were afraid. So this was a spectacle. This was amazing. And Mary Magdalene, you think about her. She had been the one who had anointed Jesus prior to his crucifixion. She's the one that took that perfume that was worth a year's wages and broke broke the perfume open and poured it on the Lord. That was her. She was the first one that God allowed to become a messenger. You see, sometimes God shows himself to us in supernatural ways. And then he encourages us to go and tell people about what God has done in our lives, what miracles he's done in our lives. It's a blessing to be commissioned by God to go out and to tell other people about what he's done for us. And God bestowed this blessing on Mary Magdalene. Scriptures tell us that she was, she was a woman that Jesus had delivered from, from demons. Mary Magdalene, before she met Jesus, was bound by chains of darkness. She had seven demons living inside her before Jesus came and delivered her. 
And she was the one that was honored with being the herald to go to the apostles and tell the apostles what Jesus, that Jesus was alive. Do you see the beauty in this? It's so beautiful. It's, it's the story of redemption, of how God takes broken people, people that are bound, and he sets them free. There's no one that can't be set free by the Lord. There's no one that's so bound that the chains can't fall off of them when Jesus speaks. When Jesus touches you, you're never the same. And this, this lady, she was firsthand witness to the power of God trying to shake off the darkness on her own. She couldn't do it. You see, when demons get into people, they can't just shake them off. Those, things have, those spirits have to be taken out by God. So when Jesus arose early on the first day of the week in verse 9, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Okay. This is written in here on purpose, my friends. God planned this out. He didn't just do this as a one-off. He planned this out and planned it to be recorded in his word for a specific reason. See, Mary was filled with joy because she had seen the miracle and she went, probably with the expectation, hey, they're going to go right on. Jesus is alive. You've seen him. You've spoken with, you've been with him. You saw an angel at the tomb. He's alive. And they're probably expecting those people to go, the apostles to go, yeah, just like he said he would. Just like he said he would. Remember the Passover meal. Remember him saying that on the third day he would arise. She was probably expecting that, but guess what? They wouldn't believe her. And another trans, in another gospel of this account, It was, even, it was even greater. They, they thought she was like, uh, woohoo. They thought she was crazy. They thought she was delusional. Even, even though Jesus had done so much, you see, the, the events surrounding the crucifixion had been so unbelievably horrible that all of the disciples, the ones that had in his core, had fled from the scene. And they still wouldn't believe when they were told that he had risen. Think about that. Peter disowned Jesus three times, denied that he even knew the Lord during the process of the crucifixion. What is the Bible trying to teach us about all about, about bringing this to light. Well, isn't this like our, our own human natures? We can encounter Jesus, watch him do miracles in our lives, watch him do miracles in the lives of others, and be amazed at what he did. We can come alongside and hear his teaching through his servants, through his word, and have closeness with him when we pray. And then when things don't go like we think they should, when things don't turn out like we expected that they would, when we see horrible things happen in and around our lives, what happens? All of us, what happens? Don't we start to doubt start to doubt the things that we've seen in the past. The faithfulness of God in the past. His great faithfulness to us and the people that we know. The miracles that he did in our lives. We start to second guess it. We start to question in our humanness. It's really so predictable. 
See, once doubt takes root, we begin to doubt God's goodness and his power, and we get gloomy, and we get depressed, and we get downhearted, and we begin to cool. But the beautiful thing is this. Despite our humanness, Jesus does not give up on us. He doesn't give up. As a matter of fact, God put this here because he knew that the thousands and thousands of people who, maybe millions of people who would read this in the future would be able to identify with what they're reading. See, Jesus doesn't give up. He sends his messengers to us. He sends his messengers to us to proclaim that he is alive. He is not dead. Jesus is alive. And the fact that God used Mary to go tell the disciples this, in our lives, there's different people and different ways that God speaks to us as well. That tells us that Jesus is alive. And our capacity in ourselves, because of the trauma that happens in our lives and the way we get, we face darkness and difficulties, our tendency is to be like the apostles, and to doubt. That's our flesh. Our flesh is a doubter. Continues today. So, Mary had a supernatural revelation and she passed it on and they wouldn't believe her. Sometimes a servant of God will have a supernatural revelation of Jesus and will come and tell us and in our flesh, what is their natural tendency? We don't want to believe. We don't want to believe. We doubt. Sometimes God can even reveal himself to us directly and we find ourselves doubting. I think of my own experience. I, when I was a young lad, I gave my heart to Jesus. I mean, I seen God's power in my family. I remember when my parents had a Bible study in their neighborhood, and everyone in the neighborhood came. It started out as a, a ladies' thing where they all smoked cigarettes and talked about God. And before you know it, their, their husbands were getting saved. Everyone was getting saved. I remember that. I remember going to church and feeling the power of the Holy Spirit speak to me as a young boy. I remember being healed of a disease when I was a little guy. This is all real. And yet, when I turned into my late teens, the hurts of life, the disturbances of life, the persecution that you face as a little Christian boy sometimes out there in the world. All the things that hurt me led me to get angry and, and hurt and bitter and pull back and lean on my own understanding and forget the things that God had done to bring me to himself. The, the glory, literally, the glory of knowing him faded because I got my eyes onto my circumstances and I began to doubt. And there was a time in my life where I was not serving Christ wholeheartedly. As a matter of fact, I had pushed him off the side and said, I'm going to do it my way. Well, thank goodness that God does not leave us or forsake us. He never leaves us out on the, out on the edge alone. Even when we walk away from him, he never walks away from us. He calls and he beckons. He says, come to me, my child. Come and lay your burdens down. I am alive. I'm not dead like they say. I'm not dead like the world tells you. I'm alive. And he doesn't give up on us. And, you know, he tries to get our attention. So, here we have it again. Moving on to verse 12. We still have this human propensity to doubt. God tries to get a hold of our attention. He sent Mary, of Mary Magdalene to tell them what happened. 
they wouldn't believe. So afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country, it says in verse 12. Well, there's not a whole lot of detail there, but the other Gospels, the beauty of the Gospels is that the four perspectives of the life and ministry of Jesus, um, they'll often talk about the same story from a different angle. And it's beautiful, actually, because you can look at the different Gospels and you can see the different angles that God puts in there. And in Luke's Gospel account, we're told of the same situation here where the two, uh, two of them, two disciples, encountered the risen Savior. And uh, these guys weren't the core 11 that remained. They're two obscure people that we don't hear about ever again. They just were mentioned in the scripture. Two ordinary guys that were following Jesus in his ministry that God saw fit to visit and to tell them that he was alive and to go and tell his disciples. You see the pattern here? God takes ordinary people to be his messengers and his servants. Don't you think that God can't take your life and use you as a messenger for somebody else? If he wants to, he will. Why? Because of his great love. He's no respecter of persons as far as prestige and all that stuff. This was said in the Gospels to show us that it's not just the apostles that experience the glory of God. It's ordinary people like you and me too. Yes, the apostles were given a certain job to do, and yes, they did it. But God used ordinary people to be his messengers for the, for the apostles. See, these two disciples, they'd obviously been leaving Jerusalem. Maybe they were thinking, oh, the, the whole thing with Jesus is over, and let's go home. And, and while they're walking down the road, this mysterious man comes and starts walking along side of them, and they are talking about the things that had happened with the crucifixion and the things that had happened with the life and ministry of Jesus. They're talking amongst themselves, and God kept them from recognizing who was walking beside them. Well, this mysterious man was listening, and uh, then began to discuss with him and, and said, hey, you guys, don't you realize the law and the prophets said that the Son of God had to go through all of this? And, oh, okay. Yeah. They still didn't recognize him because their eyes were blinded to it. Finally, they end up going on invitation of these two men. This mysterious man comes and sits down with them to have, have dinner. <laughs> and guess what? It was like a communion all over again, like a Passover meal all over again, because it says in Luke 24, 30 to 32, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like just the Passover meal with the, uh, with the 12? Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And what happened? He disappeared from their sight. Poof! Jesus was there. They wrecked this. Oh, this is the Lord. Boom. As soon as God reveals himself to them, he disappears. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Friends, yeah, Jesus appeared in risen form right there. And then, and what, did it, what was the result of the word of God alive with speaking to them? Their hearts were burning within them as he opened the scriptures to them. My friends, God has a table set before us as believers of the risen Lord who is alive. And when we come into fellowship with the risen Lord in his word, his word speaks and cuts to the very core issues of our lives. And it's like our hearts burn within us when we hear the word of God alive. And it changes us. So after says here, these two witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. They went to speak with the other disciples. Did they listen? Did they say, oh yeah, Mary said this. Now these two guys, obscure disciples as they are, they're not part of the 12. Maybe uh, there's something to this. Uh, no. These returned and reported to the rest. But, in verse 13 it says, 
but they did not believe them either. Man, we're talking like human beings. We're slow. We really are. We're slow. We're slow to hear. We're slow to listen. We're slow to understand. These 11 apostles had more than one account of the resurrection of their Lord. And he had already told them in the past that he was going to do this. See, the natural flesh, if you try to approach God in your natural flesh, and you try to understand him, and you try to follow him on your own power, you're not going to be able to do it. Why? Because we're too slow. We're too, our, our nature is too hard-hearted, is too stubborn, is too doubting. It's a doubting flesh that we have. Now, these 12 disciples. Now, Judas, you saw what happened to him. He, de- he denied Jesus, right? And then what happened? Right? You've seen what happened. And these 11 here, they're doubting, they're doubting too. These, these are the guys that he touched those who were sins on blind eyes, and boof, they were opened. He, he touched those who were sick, desperately ill, and, and, and they were raised back to health. He even spoke to Lazarus in the tomb and said, after four days of being in the tomb, and said, Lazarus, come forth, and the dead man came out of the tomb. These guys were witnesses to all of this, and yet they still doubted. What is this trying to say? You and I, if we approach God from merely a, a philosophical idea, like, a, this is a good story, and we don't open our spirit to the Lord, okay? We are no different. We're going to doubt, even if God raised someone from the dead in front of us, and a couple of weeks later, we have a hard time, we're going to doubt. Well, maybe there is something else that happened. Maybe he wasn't, maybe Lazarus wasn't really dead. Maybe that... He got locked in this tomb, and four days later, um, he, he was just unconscious, and he came alive, and, and, and then and the tomb got opened, and, and they called him forth, and he was just sitting there alive, waiting for someone to liberate him from the, from the tomb, and he was just sitting there alive, right? Really? The bad smell on everything that was there didn't stick in their mind. They, they doubted. That's the apostles. This, we're talking the apostles, the foundation believers of the church. So, verse 14 of our text, later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they're eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And there's more account, again, in the four gospels, in the other gospels, of this scenario. Well, Jesus appeared to the ten disciples first. This is how it actually broke down. That was the overall what had happened, but it broke down. He spoke to the ten disciples first, but Thomas wasn't there. I don't know if he was running an errand. He was somewhere else. But the, the ten that had seen Jesus appear to them said to Thomas, Thomas, man, it's true. Jesus is alive. We've seen him. We talk with him. And what did Thomas say? John 20, 24 to 29. Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers in where the nails were, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in. And stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas, what was his reaction? He said, My Lord and my God. I'm sure he fell down at Jesus' feet. And Jesus told him, 
Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We can all identify with these apostles, can't we? I think all of us here can. This is the human condition. And, you know, I, I shared with you what happened to me when I was younger and how God was patient and how he kept calling. And there's times where, where God does that. He just relentlessly follows us. And he gives us messengers. He gives us messages. Because he longs for us to walk with him. And, uh, but what's, so what do we do? What do we do with this flesh of ours that is doubting Thomas? That is doubting like the, the other ten apostles, doubting like, even like Judas, some of us. What do we do with this? <laughs> well, when Jesus died on the cross, I'm going to give you a, just a, a little smidgen of gold here. Of truth. When Jesus died on the cross and took away your sins, okay, it wasn't just to clean you, although it was. It wasn't just to clean you, though. God made you clean for you to be a place where he dwells by the power of his Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus understood the propensity of his disciples to fall away and to doubt but he said that he was going to go so that the Comforter could come. So that the Holy Spirit, who is the down payment, guaranteeing our future if of eternal life in heaven. It's a down, the Holy Spirit is in person, a down payment. So in that same chapter in John, a lot of people don't realize this. After those disciples were confronted and, and he said, guys, this is not good. You know, you guys are doubting everything I told you. You're doubting the witnesses that came. But I'm not going to leave you alone, my friends. I'm not going to leave you alone. I know how much you struggle with your flesh. What I'm going to do to you is I'm going to give you something else. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so that he can be in you, so that he can be your strength, so that he can help you when you're naturally prone to doubt. Again, Jesus said in verse 21, peace, this is in John chapter 20. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Same scenario here. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And when he, and with that, it says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Boom. Now, the vessel was cleansed because the Passover lamb took care of the sin issue. The death penalty was paid, so they were freed from the penalty of death. The bread of life was given them to partake in, and there was a clean vessel. And now the apostles, being clean, were filled with the Spirit. Therefore, the temple, which had its curtain rent from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified and on that day of his crucifixion, it was torn from top to bottom. The temple no longer is, is on the temple mount in Jerusalem. That's not where the temple is. Know you not that you, as believers in the living God, in Jesus Christ, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He has been given so that you will not be alone. So that no matter where you go in life, no matter what happens in your life, no matter how the waves and the turmoil hit you, he is with you. He will never leave you, forsake you. He will be with you to the very end of the age. He is the down payment guaranteeing what is to come in the future. And that future for the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ is none other than eternal glory and heaven where he will wash away all the tears from our eyes, where all things will become new. The old will be passed away. All our pain will be forgotten about. And God will bring us into his everlasting kingdom. And he shall reign forever and ever. Thus says the Lord in his word. And you can stand upon that. You can be encouraged this morning. God does not leave you alone. Those disciples... In closing, 
those disciples when they received the Holy Spirit. He commissioned them and he said, go, I'm sending you. And Mark, we're just going to read this and then we'll close. He said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. And after the Lord Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. My friends, God did what he said he would. We're sitting in this place here because the apostles were alighted by the power of God and the Spirit to share the gospel with our ancestors, the people that we have our legacy with. And we're here today because of that. See, Jesus left his earthly body and he ascended so that the Holy Spirit could come and could be with his people. And there were signs and wonders that were accompanying that. And he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah, in our natural state, if we just rely on our flesh, because we have a choice. We can walk in step with the Spirit, or we can walk in our flesh. Even as Christians, we can. But the Bible says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the sin nature. The sin nature's desires are contrary to what the Spirit says. Walk in step with the Spirit, and you will live, and you will live a life that pleases Him. So just do it. Let go of the bottom. Ask this, the Lord, God, whatever it is, I just need to trust you. I need to turn my eyes upon you. That song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's a beautiful promise, and it's true. It is so true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we might think, oh, how, how can we live? I'm so prone to wonder. I'm so prone to doubt. Well, this is where the scripture comes in. In Philippians 4.13. As believers, we can have faith in the living God because he's given us that. It's God who gives us faith. He gives us faith to trust in him. And I can do all things, not because I can pull myself up by my own shoulder, my bootstraps, I mean, wherever that came from, probably from the 30s or something. But I can't do it on my own. But Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And finally, Romans 8, 10 to 11. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of a Spirit living in you. That means we don't have to be living in defeat, my friends. We can yield to the Spirit, and we can live a life of victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Amen.